Dagens webbinarium som är det andra av totalt sex webbinarier kommer att hållas på engelska och det har titeln Transmedia Storytelling in Museums. Föredragshållare idag är Soraya Ferreira som har forskat och doktorerat inom platsbaserat berättande och idag är verksam som lärare och konsult med eget produktionsbolag. Eh, termerna transmedia och tvärmedia används lite grann synonymt på svenska. Eh, men att jag, tekniken är den samma. Det handlar om att jobba med berättande och berättande över många olika plattformar och över olika plattformsgränser. Dagens webbinarium kommer genom fallstudier att beskriva de tre huvuddelarna av tvärmedialt berättande, nämligen berättelsen, plattformen och publiken. Och kommer att ge praktiska råd om hur en organisation, ett museum kan komma igång med att tillämpa metoderna i sin egen verksamhet. Vi på Riksantikvarieämbetet vi vill genom de här webbinarierna få igång en dialog kring tvärmedialt berättande och överhuvudtaget kring berättandets möjligheter och betydelse i all förmedlingsverksamhet. Vi vill veta vad som finns, vad som inte finns och vad det finns behov av mera kunskaper kring. So, welcome Soraya Ferreira. Hi, good morning everyone. Let's start. Oops. Okay, so just a very quick background on me. In 2003, I was in New York City and this picture is the first short that I did. So I was on my first set. And if you notice something on my hand, the camera that you are seeing is not a digital camera. Okay, so I learned in analog back then. And then in 2012, I was in Sweden. Okay, so I was physically in Sweden. No, not in the webinar. And that was my first presentation of my PhD. And I was researching transmedia storytelling in tourism, which is what I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit now. So it's very funny that I'm you know, teaching you the webinar right now. And I'm actually with a glass of champagne. So see how welcome I was in Sweden. This was my second day in Sweden, okay? And I was already in the city hall with a glass of champagne. So this trip was awesome. Now, after all these years, I consult and teach in four different places at uh, University of Porto, at the Portugal Tourism School, and also at the European Movie Masters. So I teach storytelling to all of them. This last semester, I had two, 200 students. So it's a lot of grading that I'm just finishing now. It was awesome. So today we are going to be talking about what is transmedia storytelling? What are the key elements? What are the story elements? and also a case study that I did. So starting with a challenge for you, I'm going to show you a slide with a sentence and I'm going to ask you to see if you can memorize it, okay? So let me just first have the chat, okay? And here we go. Okay, everyone ready? Let's see. So two legs play with one leg on top of four legs. Four legs jump to four legs and steal one leg. Two legs run after four legs and gets back her one leg. Okay, did you understood this or can you remember this? No, right? Now let me change this sentence uh, instead of data let's change into a story form and let's see if this is easier for you. So a girl plays with a toy pirate on top of a table. A cat jumps to the table and steals the toy. The girl runs after the cat and gets back to her pirate toy. See the difference, exactly the same thing, but instead of data, I have a story. So my question for you, is is it easier to remember data or, or is it easier to remember story? So this is not a scientific experiment, okay? This is just an exercise so we can imme immediately see how our, how our brain works exactly. And I'm seeing everyone in your story. So my ne next question for you, oh, and also I want to share with you this story. This is from my city, I'm, I'm from Porto, Portugal, okay? And there we have a library 
which is considered one of the most beautiful libraries in the world. I don't know if you know it, it's more than 100 years old, okay? So like 15 years ago, this library was near bankrupt, okay? So they were almost going to close because they didn't have any sales. Then there was a story that appeared, which is that the Harry Potter, the story, one of the locations was inspired by this library because the author used to live in Porto. And because of that story, this is the entrance of the library. Okay, I was I went to the coffee shop and then I, I came out and I saw all of these people lining up and it continues. And then it continues. They actually had to close the, the, the street because they have so many people there. So what is the difference of this library, you know, a hundred years ago and now? The location is the same. The only difference is the story that now is attached to the library. And see the difference? Okay, so like I said, not a, a, a scientific experiment, but we can see how important stories are for our businesses. So now my question for you is, is uh, are your museums or organizations showing data or are, are they telling stories? So this is a question that you should be asking yourself, okay? So what is transmedia storytelling? I usually um, show these, uh, these puzzles and why? Because transmedia means that I'm telling, uh, I have a story universe, that's why you are seeing uh, the yellow. And then within that story universe, I have different stories, okay? But the stories, they all connect like a puzzle. And when they all connect, it's like you have a bigger story. So that was transmedia means. You have a story world, you have many stories, like I said, you have many platforms. And one thing that it's very, very uh, important is that uh, the different platforms, the stories, they are not the same, okay? It's not an adaptation, but it's an expansion, okay? So you're not telling the same because it's like, if I already know this story, why am I going to another platform to know the same story? It doesn't make sense. So we need, okay, different stories. And when you are thinking about transmedia storytelling, you need to think about always three different things together, okay? Which is story, and we are going to see all of them. So we have story, we have platforms, and we have audience. And the three of them need to work together. And now I'm going to ask you another question. I'm sorry about all the questions, but that's how I usually work. So my question is, imagine if I have a story and I'm putting the story on Twitter and my target audience. So I have the story, the platform is Twitter and my audience are, is my grandmother, for example. Do you think it's going to work if I put the story, which is an awesome story, okay? Like the best in the world. And, but it's for my grandmother on Twitter. Do you think it's going to work? Okay, no, exactly. Can you tell me why it's not going to work? I agree with you, okay? This is not a trick question. I agree with you. So can you tell me why it's not going to work? Wrong media, exactly. Yeah, exactly, wrong media. is like my, my grandmother, she doesn't have an account on Twitter, okay? So it's not going to work. And that's why the three need to work together. Uh, another example. So I have uh, uh, the story, I have an amazing story. Uh, I have the audience, which is like an adult audience, and the platform that I'm going to choose is, for example, Facebook. So most of the people are on Facebook, it's fine. The problem is that the story is very long. It's like almost a book. Do you think it's going to work if I put all of that story on Facebook? Exactly. It's not going to work because the format, it's long story and it works better if it was on ebook or if it was on medium, okay? And that's why these three things always need to work together, okay? When you are uh, trying to come up with your own strategy. Okay, so audience. Um, so right now, this is how our audience is. This is actually my picture. So the first one that you are seeing was my experiment in, uh, I went to a VR arcade and it was in Tallinn. 
because I teach at the European Movie Master. So I had to go to Estonia to teach there at university. And as, as soon as I finished school, I went to the, to the shopping mall and they had this arcade. So I was experimenting with this. And then the other picture is, you know, with my cell phone in, in Porto. So this is how the audience is right now, right? So it's like cell phones everywhere, always connected to the, to the internet. They are always wanted immersive experiences. They want experiences. So our audience, a lot of, a lot of the audience right now is like this. Then we have the platforms. So it's very important that for all the platforms that you choose, you think about what is the objective of the platform? How are you going to use the platform? And also about the audience of the platform. So these are just some questions, okay, that you need to think about when you are choosing uh, the platform. And also it's very important for the platforms to be coherent. Okay, because I need to know that I'm seeing a website and I know that the website belongs to the, has the same image as the Twitter account or the Facebook account. So there needs to be a coherency amongst all of the platforms. Okay, so this is important. So I know that I'm seeing the same project. And now story. So to build stories, there's always four elements that you need to think about. So these are present in all stories and starting with the theme. Then we have characters, story world and story structure. So let's start with theme. So this is my birthday cake, okay? As you see, stories everywhere with me, even my birthday cakes need to tell a story, okay? So this is the year that I was researching transmedia storytelling tours. And that's why on top, you are seeing the different platforms. So you see there's like a game, a camera, email, you know, cell phone, computer. So you have the platforms on top. And then below you have the symbols that represent tourists. So that was my theme of the cake. And then when I finished my PhD, I had this one. I know it's a little bit dark, but this is tourism in space because I thought that was the next frontier. I mean, yesterday we saw that um, there was, you know, the, the uh, landing on Mars. So it's, it's funny, but yeah, we have tourism in space. So that's the theme. So there's always a theme that you need to think about. I'm remembering now that two years ago, I went to Scotland and they have a Christmas shop. Do you have Christmas shop in Sweden? Because in Portugal, we don't have them. You have them, right? Okay, so I don't know if it's the same thing in Sweden, you'll let me know. But when I, because I saw a Christmas shop, I never saw one before, so I entered and it was June, okay? So when I entered the Christmas shop, the first thing that I heard was Merry Christmas. And when I heard that, I gave a step backwards because I was, it's June, okay? June is in the middle of Christmas. So why is she wishing me Merry Christmas? But then I, I thought about it and I'm like, she's completely right because this is a Christmas store and the theme is Christmas. So how do you greet people in Christmas? You wish them Merry Christmas, see? So that's the theme. Uh, characters, continue in Scotland. When I arrived, it was midnight, uh, mid, uh, midnight, okay? Everyone was really tired. And when we left the airplane, which now, I mean, I think for everyone, it seems like ages ago, right? Being on an airplane and, and coming off, but okay. So we went down and then we had the bus to take us to, the, to, the, to our luggage. And then on the handles, they had stories. And I couldn't believe that on the bus, okay, in the airport, they were already telling the stories of Scotland. So this was one information that I saw. The unicorn is the national an animal of Scotland. I didn't know this and they had much more information. People thought I was crazy, you know, because I was like so excited at midnight, you know, inside the, the bus, but yeah, they had stories everywhere. And then when I was, you know, sightseeing Scotland, I was seeing unicorns everywhere. They were in the fountains, in the walls, everywhere. And I knew the meaning because I had that information as soon as I left the airplane. So this is a very interesting character in Scotland, okay? Then the story world. 
the story world. In Portugal, there's a, a museum, which is a chocolate factory. It's actually a hotel, a museum, and a store. And it's all about chocolate. So as soon as you are entering the building, you have like chocolate melting on top of the ceiling. And then you enter and then the, the lamp is like chocolate flowing. And then on the table, you have more chocolate and the walls are like um, pieces of chocolate. So, I mean, okay, story world chocolate, we have no question about it. So that's the story world. Story structure, okay. So this is the simple story structure that you can have, okay? The story has a beginning, middle, and an end. This was Aristotle's that told us a long time ago, and it's still valid, okay? So we have time, place, and character. That's how we begin our story. And then we have the inciting incident. This is the reason why the story takes place. And then we have the progressive complications, which is a conflict. And then we have the climax, which is the dramatic part, which is um, higher. And then we have the resolution. So I'm going to show you an example of how I built this structure in a project that I did, because I think it's, it's easier for you. So in 2018, I, because I, in all my projects, I always experiment different platforms. So in this one, I never published a book on Amazon. So I really wanted to see how it was, you know, the whole process. So I did this prototype and it was called Travel Guide for Kids Portal. So the origin of the story was that my goddaughter was going to turn one years old, one. So I was thinking, what was the gift that I could give her that, of course, is not buying gifts because I, you know, I can give her a lot of gifts like that, but I wanted one gift that I made myself. And I was thinking to myself, what is the most important thing that I can give her? And for me, it's the culture, okay? So I wanted to give her a story of her culture, which is mine. So she, in the future, knows, uh, knows it. So that's the beginning of the, of the story. And then I divided the book into three different parts. So the first one was your adventure. So it was very simple text. So the kids could go, uh, could go on this adventure. Then we had the second part, which was historical information. So it's more information about the monuments for the parents. And then there was a third part, which were the games, because I thought it was fun to have games connected to the story. So I, I did the games also. So what is this story about? So the main character of the story is Prince Harry the Navigator. He was one of the, the people responsible for the kickoff of the Portuguese discoveries, okay? So he's the main protagonist. And the story is the, ch uh, the child must um, go after the sword that Prince Henry has and defeat Adamastor. And the Mastor was a monster that was created by a Portuguese poet uh, more than 500 years ago. And this monster represents uh, all the dangers of the discoveries. So it's like a metaphor. So what I did was I went and researched the locations in my city that had to do with this story. And then I organized the, the, um, the locations. So the beginning of the story, it has three locations. And the first location is a church, okay? And the first location, the part of the story is your mission. So the character, Prince Henry, he's saying to the child, your mission is to find my sword. And for that, um, the, the child goes to this church so she can see the prince, uh, an image of the prince. Then the second place is uh, where I was born. So this is actually the house where this prince was born. He was born in Porto, I mean, a long time ago, but the child goes to the house to see the house. Then the third location is uh, my secret mission. So the mission of Prince Henry, which is true, okay, was to build a fleet in Porto. And then with the fleet in Porto and Lisbon, they, go, they went to Africa and conquered Celta. So these are the three uh, first locations. And then in the middle, we have the conflict and everything that was necessary for this trip. So we have the building of the ships. So this is a lighthouse in Porto, which is uh, one of the oldest in the, the Iberian Peninsula. And then we have preparing food for the boat. 
praying, which is Porto Cathedral. Then we have conquering Ceuta and then getting ready to fight the Damastor, which is finding the sword. So all of these locations are connected to the middle of the story. And then the end of the story, we have two locations, which is victory is ours, meaning that the child goes to a museum, which actually has a Damastor, and then the child goes on the, uh, inside the museum, and then there's a part where there's like a, um, a train, and then the train goes uh, below the Mastor, and it's like it's conquering the Mastor. So that's the victory. And then my legacy. So even though it's more than 500 years ago, we can see this character represented in different places in the city. So this is just for the child to understand that you know, you can see this character in many places. So this is the story and see how it follows this uh, structure. So you have the time, place, character, the inciting incident, which is to find the sword to the to defeat the Mastor. Then we have the complications, which is building the fleet and the food and being afraid and all of that. The climax is defeating the Mastor. And then we have the resolution, which is his legacy. So this is the um, this is just for you to see the story structure. Yes, you can have the slides afterwards. Uh, I don't know uh, if Victor can send them to you or if you send me an email and I'll send you the presentations. I don't know. Awesome. And he knows the, the word thank you in Portuguese. That's awesome. I was going to try that, but I was afraid. So, so I don't know, Victor, at the end, when we are question and answering, okay, we'll see what, what is the best way for everyone to get the slides, okay? So anyone? Uh, sometimes they <laughs> so anyone has any question about this project so I can go and continue the presentation. Hmm? Okay. Moving on, this is my second project that I want uh, to present to you. And this is my, it was uh, the project that I did for my PhD and it's a transmedia storytelling project. Okay, so now you are going to see all the platforms working together. So it took place in 2012 and the story was uh, simple. It was uh, the, the tourists coming to Portugal. They were challenged to discover a hidden treasure. So my idea for this project was instead of people having those travel guides, you know, that are huge, they had a project like this. This doesn't mean that you need to go to all the locations. It just means that you go to the locations that you want, okay? But you need to have a lot of them. So I created these characters. So you have the protagonist of the story, uh, which is Peter. And I put, uh, and he's called Peter Smith because it's one of the most common names that I, I did a Google search so everyone can identify with being Peter Smith, okay. And then I have Kevin Smith. And why did I create this character? Because uh, there was YouTube and, and Peter was talking to someone. So I needed to create a character for him to be talking to someone. So it was a little brother that had to stay in, in uh, England. And why did I choose England? Because when I did my research, the English tourists are the, the ones that come most to Porto. So that's why he's English. And then on the other side, you have Philippe. And the reason why he's very black was because when I created him, I still didn't have an actor to represent him. So that's why he's very black. So at the end, I could choose any, any actor to play him. Okay, so this was a project with a very little budget and that's why I had to do stuff like that. And then you have Miguel, which is the mentor of the story. So the, those are the characters that I created. The other ones, the characters of the story, they are all real. So they are the kings and the merchants. So all the other characters are real, okay? So how did I create the story? Uh, yeah, they were all men, I don't know why. Yeah, I mean, now that you are pointing out, yes, I don't know why, because I wrote the story, so it made sense for me to have any female, but next time I need to do that. So, um, in terms of how did I write the story, I read more than 50 books on Porto story. So I read from all the different historians, I read everything that I could, and then I organized the story, I picked the locations that I thought made more sense, and then I organized the stories into chapters. 
So for example, we have the Roman chapter, which is when uh, the Romans were here in Porto. And then we have, for example, the Porto siege. We have the, the Porto wine, which I know that people come here to Porto to try the wine. So I had to have a chapter like that. So I had all, those, all of those chapters. And how could you do the story? You could do the story in three different ways. So the first way was to do the story from beginning to end in terms of chronological order. So this is the part of the Romans and then you did the whole thing like this, okay? Then you that was one option. The second option was to do only the chapter that you want. For example, I visit Porto and I only care about the wine. I don't want to know anything else. So you go to the chapter of Porto wine that you are seeing here and then you have an introduction and then can you see these little circles? So these circles are the locations. Uh, it's below the 28 on the, on the red. It's above the story, the souvenir, the wind. There's four circles. And these are the locations that are associated with this chapter. So there was this, uh, this uh, location and then there was this and then another one. So if you could only change the picture and I think the, oh, okay. The pre, uh, let me try and share again the presentation, okay? Because you are telling me that it's frozen. Okay. Okay, can you see it's moving? No? It seems like it actually just started screen sharing but we don't come further than that um wow and i didn't even change anything no that's really weird um uh, yeah hang on try, try that again um just yeah i'm going to to share the whole screen can you see the whole screen uh right now we're not seeing anything though okay um, Oh, Whoa. hang on, hang on, hang on, because I wasn't, uh, it's not yet. Okay. Can you see it? No, we actually can't. It just oh. stops at, at the screen just before it. I've never been through this before, so <laughs> this is uh, this is something new. Yeah, um, I mean, usually with me, those, okay. So now I'm just sharing that. No, still no? No, no, it's still not. Uh, maybe we should actually try to, uh, if you just log out and uh, come back in and uh, okay. we'll see if we could uh, solve it that way. Okay, I'm the... going to log out. I'm sorry about this, but yeah. No, okay, don't I'm be logging sorry. out <laughs> and then I'll come out. Okay, yeah. so hang on. See you soon. So we'll just have to wait there. Um, Jag är inte riktigt säker på vad det var som hände här. Jag har inte varit med om det här förut, så det är märkligt. Vi testar bara och se om... Ser ni ett fönster nu? Ja, okej. Okay. Då verkar det vara på Sorayas ände där. Då eh, hoppas vi att det... Nu! Hon var tillbaka. Men är det du som delar, Viktor? Ja. Så har vi en lösning på det också om det skulle vara så. Nej, nu är Soraya tillbaka. Soraya, you're back, but uh, you're muted. Okay, is it working? It is working again, yes. Uh, uh, okay, so these are new slides. Okay, can you see the new slides? <laughs> Yep. Okay. Yep. Now okay. we're done. Great. Let's continue. Okay. So what I was uh, saying, let me just have the, the chat. Okay. So what I was saying is that you could do the story in three different ways. So the first way is chronologically in terms of dates. The other one has to do with the chapters that interest you. So if you want to know about port wine and you want and you only want to go to these locations, you can go. So you have here the four different uh, circles. So the, those are the four locations associated with this story. 
Okay, so see the different locations. And then the third way to do the story was just by location. I'm walking and I see this location and I know the story. Okay, it's this one. And I know the story about this location. So you had three different ways that you could do the story. Then the, this was the mobile app. This is how it opened. So you had the different locations here and then you choose. And then you went to the location. So here you see this little man here. And I did this because whenever I travel, I always get lost, always. And I say that in the project that I do, I'm going to make something that this is not going to happen. And so I inserted this little man. And it means that when you click, it's like I'm here. And immediately it gives you the way to the location that you want. I mean, now this is pretty simple, but back in 2012, you know, it wasn't as simple as it is now. Then the other problem that I had with the project was that these are historical monuments. So I cannot have people actually going to the monuments and try to find the treasure, okay? Because they cannot touch anything and I needed to be careful with that. So I invented a frequency that the treasure emanates, okay? So there's a frequency that can only be uh, known by the cell phone. So it's like, you need to go to the location, do the check-in, and then it gives you this message. Do you want to check in and find out if the treasure is there? And you say yes or no, and then it's searching for the treasure. And then I didn't want anyone to find any treasure. So the answer was always no, and you need to continue to the next location. And I'm going to show you why I did that, okay? So another thing that the app had, because you know that tourists, they always want souvenirs. So I didn't have any budget for you know physical souvenirs. So I invented the digital souvenir, which is this one. So you put here the picture that you want that you took on your mobile and immediately it gives you this frame and you can share it on uh, the um, on email, on Facebook and also on Twitter. Back then we didn't have Instagram and all of that. Okay, so these were the social media that were uh, most common. And then you share this with your friends. So this was the digital souvenir. And then besides the mobile app, which is the platform that I showed you right now, we, we also had the website. So this was the website. Here on top, you have the social media related to the project, which is Facebook and Twitter. Then you have here the, the, the trailer and then follow Peter. And here you have the social media of the main character. So he was talking to the people directly. And it was interesting because when I was doing an um, interview to the radio, the host, uh, she asked me, oh, so the, this means that now we can walk in Porto and meet Peter. And I was thinking to myself, okay, I invented Peter. He doesn't exist. Am I going to say, it's like, you know, telling uh, children that Santa Claus doesn't exist. You know, I was thinking, okay, am I going to tell people that no? Oh yes, so it was interesting. And then here you could share your experiences. So we have the mobile app, we have the website, and these are the platforms that I was talking to you about. So you had Facebook and Twitter for the project itself. And then you have the three platforms of the character, Peter, uh, it was the um, Pinterest, YouTube, and Twitter. So for example, on Twitter, something interesting happened. Uh, I was telling people, oh, I'm going to this location. And people started interacting on Twitter saying, oh, I'm loving the picture. It was actually on Sunday. Uh, back then there were no, you know, um, scheduling posts. So I had to do everything by hand every day. And this took three months, the whole project. So it was Sunday. I was having a break at a um, uh, friend's house. And then I posted the, this post saying, oh, I'm going to this location. But the audience thought it was really interesting. And they sent me you know, uh, messages saying, oh, I love the pictures, I want to see more. And if you have people telling you, I want to see more, what do you do? You go and you give them more, right? So, so people didn't understand why, why I wasn't having lunch and I was, you know, in the computer trying to see and find more pictures that I had. And then I was putting them on Twitter and people were interacting. So that was very cool. And then on Pinterest, the results, 
who are also very interesting because Pinterest was a very new network in 2012, but I heard about it and everyone was saying, oh, for tourism is going to be important. And I said, okay, so why not? Let's experiment. And it was actually the, the network that had more followers. It was Pinterest. And it was interesting because people uh, were putting the pins and creating boards uh, relating to travel and to food, which was exactly what I wanted. So Pinterest was also very cool. And then we had a print map because in 2012, we didn't have so many smartphones like we have now. And people were always complaining, saying, oh, but if I don't have a smartphone, how can I do the project? And I'm like, OK, fine, I'll do the, the print map. So actually, the city hall, uh, they allowed us to use this map. And then I put on top the locations. And this map was being um, given at the airport and also at the tourism center so people would arrive to the city and this is how they had the first contact with the, the project so this was the print map and now let's go uh, and now let's go to experiences because for me visiting a place it's not only seeing the monuments which they are awesome but it's much more than that so when you visit Porto, and I hope everyone now, you know, I'm like, okay, come to Porto and visit Porto. But uh, if you visit Porto, there are several things that I think everyone should try and do. So the first one has to do with drink port wine. Okay. So I had, so I, I went to um, a wine cellar and I told them about the project. So they were one of the partners of the project. So if you went to the wine cellar, you will have an extra location that was only on the wine cellar. Then another partner was the food. Okay, very important, the gastronomy here. So if you visit Porto, you need to try different kinds of food. So I had a restaurant. It was a partner restaurant. Here it is. So this is the, um, the street, Ribeira, which is the, um, uh, by the river. And then here you had the extra location of the story. Be because remember, uh, transmitted storytelling is not the same story. You have different pieces of the story. So if you, want to, if you went to this location, you had another part of the story. And of course, you have the experience part, which was to eat. This is called fish because you know that Portuguese people are crazy about codfish, a lot of them. So one of the dishes was codfish, OK? So we have the wine, we have the food. And then the other thing is the boats. See the, the boats, Rebelo boats, they are very traditional. So you need to do the, the sightseeing inside the boat and go under all, all of the bridges. So that was another partner of the project, OK? And if you went there, you had another location. And then I had the oh, and then I had a souvenir shop because they, you know, they 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 love that. So I had a souvenir shop. Let me just see the chat. I say the print mat, you can see the better of the whole area. Yes, I agree. I mean the project with Peter. Oh, if it exists, okay. So it's like the website is no longer present because Google only likes re responsive uh, websites and in 2012 that was a concept that didn't exist yet so the website is not the um, social media is all there if you want like a uh, archive the app the problem with the app is that on on the iphone it's not working anymore because of all the new versions but my students told them told me that for android it's still working I don't know why. So if you have an older version of iPhone, it should work. It's on App Store. And if you have the Android, also try and you have the app to, to see if it's working. The print map, I have some copies. OK, I only have a copies that were left. OK, uh, so you have those four partners, OK? And you have pieces of the story also in those four partners. So. The, I mean, I was doing the project more or less alone, and then I had to ask help to different teams to do it. But I still wanted more for this project. So I wanted for this project to be a social responsibility project. So I looked for um, 
So I looked for a, a institution that I believed in. And here in Porto, we have a hospital like the main hospital and the pediatric wing was, I mean, they needed work and they need to build a new pediatric wing. So I went to them and I told them, well, I can give you publicity for the project and see if, if we can raise more awareness because I knew money, it will be a little bit of money, but still what I did was I created a menu in the restaurant, which was called travel plot menu. And when the tourists bought the menu, one euro went towards this hospital wing. So by the end, the treasure that was fake in the beginning because it didn't exist, by the end, it was actually money that was donated to the city. So it's like the tourists that visit Porto, they actually left something that helps the, the people that live here. And this is how it looks like, okay? So here, the app map and website, this is how you can do the project even in an active way. So you need to be active and looking for the platforms. If you want to be on your couch and do it in a passive way, because now with COVID, we need to do things in a passive way, you have this part of the project, which is the video, Twitter, and Pinterest, because the main character, he was going to all the locations, okay? So you could do the project in an active way and in a passive way. So you have here the map, uh, the app, the map, and the website. Then you have the experiences that I was talking to you about. There was also an extra location of the story. So it was 42 locations, okay? It was huge. And it's the questionnaire. Why? Because this was, I needed data for my PhD. So I really wanted to make sure that people, you know, um, fill out the questionnaire. As you know, it's something hard to do. Okay, so you had all of this, okay? And it took three months. So this was launched on the 17th of June and it ended on the 9th of October. And why did I choose three months? Because this is the high season in Porto. So this is the summer for us. And it's when, you know, they visit the most. And here in June on the 23, we have like the biggest celebration, which is St. John Festival, that everyone comes to the streets and we have thousands and thousands of people. So that was the kickstart. And then the end on October, it's when we, I mean, in terms of the wine, we go and, col and collect the grapes, the, the grapes. So that, that has to do with the wine theme. So we have all of this and they're still missing. So people went and looked for the locations and the treasure, they, they didn't find anything, right? But as you know, the story has the beginning, middle and an end. So we have the beginning, let's go and find the treasure. The middle, we cannot find the treasure. And now the end is finally the treasure, okay? So I put the treasure, the story finale was actually inside the wine cellar because of the theme, uh, the theme of the project. So here are the two characters. So this is the British character. And now I have my villain. So now I have the character, the, the actor playing the villain. Okay, so this was the confrontation. It was a live confrontation inside the, the wine cellar. And this is the finding of the treasure. <clears throat> so you have here the tourists that were there. And here you have the treasure. So now just some side notes. I wanted the treasure to be inside the wine barrel, but I didn't understand anything about wine barrels. Okay. I had no, I thought that, okay, so they are all, and, and I, I just go there and ask for a wine barrel. And then I put the stuff inside. That's what I thought. I didn't realize that old wine barrels are even more valuable and the smell of the wine inside, how am I going to put anything inside? Okay. So that was just something that I discovered doing this project. But I actually went to this, a store like Home Depot in Portugal and they had two vases. They look like wine barrels. So I put one vase on top of the other. And that's why you have them like that because they are actually two vases, two plant vases. And then the problem was that to open, they had to open like this. So in the wine cellar, all the barrels, they are lying. And then this one had to be like this because it was the only way to open. So of course it was really easy to find where the treasure was, but see, these are the things that we need to do to discover. So this was the end. But then we also had a resolution. 
and the resolution was asking people on the on Facebook. So we discovered one of Porto Treasure, which was this, but the city has many more treasures. So tell me for you, what is another treasure that the city has? So that was the question that I put on Facebook and then people also answered. So that was the resolution of the project. So the um, press conference, I did a press conference, which is what you are seeing right now. And as I told you, the theme is like, I want to do the press conference inside a boat. See this boat. So I had the press conference inside, that's the Rivella boat. Uh, and then we have here the press and this is the mascot for the hospital. So the mascot was also here with me and then you have all the press. And then this is the backdrop of the city. So this was all theme related. Then in terms of press, it was really good. So I went to the radio. This is just a picture of the, the, the news. So it was on the news saying it was an innovative project. Then, for example, on Facebook, Visit Portugal, which is the organization here in Portugal uh, that's in charge of the tourism. They took the project and they um, released it. Also the newspaper. So we had you know, a lot of press on the newspapers and then on Twitter. So this is just the feedback. So you can see some feedback that I got from the people. So one of them just wrote, uh, wow, beautiful. Thanks for sharing. Wish I could be there too. I'll be waiting for more pictures, which is exactly what we want, right? When we are there, yes, we want people to come. Then I had another one saying I'm from Porto. No one loves some of these places, but never bother to visit certain places. After your pics, I'll change that. So that's what we want. We want people that are from Porto to get to know, you know, their own city. And then another one was your tweets are making me want a treasure hunting in Porto. So this is just some feedback that I got and it's what I, uh, we needed. And then uh, another objective of the project was for it to be a case study in different areas because transmedia storytelling involves a lot of things. So I did this search on Google and you can see that it's a case study in different books. So you can see it's in language and arts, this in computers, in business and economics. So it's like it was able to cross all over. And now my question is, I showed you all of this. So can transmedia storytelling work in museums? I think yes. I think it made, makes total sense because you have a huge story world that has so many stories that you cannot, it's not possible to share in a single platform. You also have different platforms uh, that allow you, for example, now with COVID, people don't need to go to the museum to have access to the stories of the museum. So you can have them in the different media. It also allows you to engage. So it's really, really important to have a strategy like this. I, the results that you can expect, you can have uh, you, your brand visibility can be increased. You can reach different audiences. You can create shareable experiences and you can also generate loyalty and engagement. So these are all things that you can um, have by doing a project like this. Let me just read really quickly the, um, the chat. So the crucial problem, the technical changes. Yes, I mean, technology, I cannot even begin to tell you the, all the problems of technology. For example, one of the main problems that I had with this project, you want to know what it was? It was the internet. So Porto, when I released this, there was no free Wi-Fi. I mean, they had like a pilot experience, but when people arrived to the airport and they were in the city, they couldn't have, uh, they couldn't con connect um, for free to the Wi-Fi. So how could they uh, then load the app? So that was one of the problems that we had back then. Then after this project, now you have free Wi-Fi. And then the problem is always, yes. And for example, now the algorithm, of the social media, it's a, also a problem because you need to pay to play, right? So to be on social media, so there's a lot of problems. 
And then how did the people search for the treasure during the summer uh, take part in the resolution? I mean, everyone who participated in the treasure hunt could not exactly. So the uh, because tourists in Porto, usually they only stay two to three days. So it was expected for them not to find the treasure, okay? And they were, they were going to see the end of the story in the social media. So the objective was for them to, to see that. Okay, uh, and are there any conditions with co-working with the platforms? Okay, I didn't understand that question, but we'll, we'll go over it at the end, okay? Nina. Well, the question is, are there any conditions with co-working with the platforms? But then we'll talk and it's going to be easier to respond. Oh, another thing that it's really, really, really important, okay, is that there is no formula for transmedia projects, okay? No formula. So for each project, you need to think about what is the story that you want to tell, what is your audience, where is the context that you are in and the resources that you have at your disposal because everyone is in a different situation okay so the fun thing about transmedia is the adaptation that it has for example if you want to start i started with all of these platforms at the same time because i had a year to prepare and then i launched this okay but you can start with one or two platforms and then after I don't know how long, you add a third platform and then another one. So it's like a puzzle. You don't need to start everything at the same time, but you can start building um, depending on the resources that you have and the team that you have, okay? So don't think that you need to start all of this. Okay, let me just see more questions. How loyalty and engagement manifests in transmedia storytelling? So loyalty means that I launch one platform and then if I launch another platform, the, the audience knows that and then they can follow it. So they are becoming loyal fans because they are following the different platforms of the, of the, of the museums or organization or the projects. And in terms of engagement is because as you saw the project that I just showed you, uh, people, uh, they engage with the project. So you saw people engaging with Peter so they were sharing and they were telling me, I want to know more about this and I want to know more, more, more about that. So that's how the engagement is also um, being seen like this. And also, oh, the cost. Okay, are there any conditions with co -over? So I think Nina is talking about the cost of the platforms. I can tell you, for example, on Travel Plot, the, the project that I just showed you, I had different partners and they helped me with the costs. So even though they weren't giving me money, they were helping me, you know, using their facilities and giving me some resources that they had. So, of course, the, the costs were uh, divided. So, step by step, it was what I was talking about, okay? Transmedia is step by step, okay? You don't need to do everything at the same time. So if this is a, the project that I'm doing right now, the Transmedia Storytelling Project, this is a business uh, project, which is my brand. It's called Story SD, and I don't have time to break down this project uh, in, this, uh, in this webinar right now. But if you want more information about storytelling, all the resources here are free. So you have a podcast that I do, and you have the lecturers and recommended podcasts, re recommended books. I mean, the whole thing, okay? So everything you can consult for free. So if you want more information about all of this, you have here. And this is the end, which is I was supposed to finish at 10, eh? 10, 1. So now we have time for your questions. So if you want to put questions, you can turn on the mic and we can talk, okay? I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much, Soraya. It was a great and inspiring presentation. And I've seen a lot of questions coming in here around the chat and also a lot of praise for, for the uh, great in, and inspiring hour here. Um, so if anyone wants to ask any questions, just 
fire away and as Soraya said you'd be free to also turn on your microphone if you want to you could switch to gallery mode so we could see those of you who are left here as you can see there's still coming in a lot of praise here uh, so. okay, thank you so much <laughs> I, I could listen to your presentation all day that's a that, that's a good one <laughs> yeah that's awesome thank you you know my problem actually it's to reduce to one hour conversation because i have much more and that's why we were talking about doing a workshop because i have much more to to talk about uh, soraya yes yeah i, I just uh, i got so tired of the chat so i thought yeah, I that's why i said now let's <laughs> let's talk let's talk yeah no I, I don't have any interesting things to say except a very big thank you to you and it's oh. very inspiring and it's also a challenge for example for me working at a, a communal museum with no budget at all to try to find ways and i think there are ways just that we have to update our technical knowledge i'm a dinosaur in technique so uh, i'm starting to learn so thank you very very much you're welcome but actually i mean i think the first step that everyone needs to do is just to see what is the content that they have and the stories that they have so that's the first uh, thing is to you know for the strategy and then afterwards you think about platforms you can start with the platforms that you are more used to for example a pamphlet a book you know something that doesn't have a lot of technology in it and then afterwards then you go into the technology platforms the my objective here is for you to start i just want everyone to start thinking about this and then like i said step by step Oh, sorry, I found an interesting question here in the chat, uh -huh. uh, speaking about technology and uh, the development of technology. Uh, so the question is, what would you do differently when looking at all the technological possibilities we have in 2021, augmented reality, XR, etc.? Honestly, for me, I will do everything because I love to experience, you know, all the platforms that I never did. I will do it. The problem back then, it was, I mean, just the team. It was a very, very small team, the budget, and it was the thing that was possible. For example, augmented reality and uh, virtual reality, I actually did a short film in 360 uh, a couple of years ago. And in terms of immersive, it's really awesome. And you could use that to, to tell a lot of different stories. So we'll, we'll definitely try and do that. But the problem is always the budget that you have. So yeah, but for me, I will try all the different platforms, okay? Like I said, think about what your audience is into if they, they want a platform like that and if it makes sense for your story. I can tell you, for example, in Portugal, we have a bridge, which is, I don't know if you know it, is similar to the San Francisco Bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge. So if there's an, they call it uh, experience. And if you go there, you can see inside the bridge and they also have a, a virtual reality experience. I didn't know what it was when I went inside, but when I put the glasses, what was that experience? Is because for the maintenance of the bridge, you need to go all the way up the bridge, and then you need to pull the cables to make sure that everything is working. It's the only way to go up there. And it's like I was on the top of the bridge watching the whole thing. That's an experience that I will never want to go by myself, you know, because I was scared. But virtual reality really gave me a different perspective of how the bridge works. And when I left, I told the people that work there, oh, you must uh, be very brave to work in this, you know, in this bridge and be able to do that. And they were telling me, oh, it's OK, we have a cable and it's safe. But that experience was only possible in virtual reality. So depends on the project, like I said. OK, thank you. I did get a question here about uh, what methods you suggest for evaluation of the experiences? 
Uh, for me, it's really just do a little bit of research. I know the platforms, each platform has a set, you know, of, uh, of, um, of parameters that we need to know. And then I see the audience. And then I think about what the success looks like for me to use that platform. If I want, you know, this type of behavior, for example, on Twitter, I wanted people to engage. So if I had people replying, I wanted that type of engagement. I want X amount of followers. So I make all of those parameters and then that's how it works. Is your job still alive for tourism? So, like I said, it's not, I mean, you can find the platforms somewhere and in terms of tourism right now, what I'm doing is consulting and training in the, in this area. So I don't know if I answer this question. And then what about working together with storyteller performers? Awesome. I think it's awesome. Okay. There's nothing like telling stories um, face to face. Okay, nothing like that. I mean, I'm talking this and I have a PhD in digital media. Okay, so I do have a PhD, but there's nothing, nothing uh, like uh, talking face to face and having uh, actual human beings, you know, uh, in the projects. Uh, have to leave. Thank you. Yes, the museum itself is also a platform. Exactly. Yes. So thank you so much, Soraya, for this and everyone else for participating in this uh, great lecture here. It's been very inspiring also to us. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to talk with everyone. As you can see, something that I really love. So 